My name is Sara Mendes and I am a solution manager in the SAP Automotive Industry Business Unit with focus exactly on the after sales area. So, Frank? Yeah, my name is Frank Rode from Western Aha. I'm a solution architect in the supply chain planning area and specialized in the after sales processes focusing on the SPP and ESPP module. Warm welcome from my side. So what can we expect um, today? We have a short introduction that we are already doing. Uh, then the second part is a little bit uh, a repetition or a summary of the webinar number one. So if you missed webinar one, uh, you can catch up in the first couple of minutes uh, and know what we already showed. Um, and then you can expect on part number three, that is the main, uh, the main content of the webinar today that is the operational planning. Um, so we are explaining DRP deployment and inventory balancing. And we are not um, only showing slides, we jump into the system and let you see how the system works and what you can do um, within these three processes. Um, last but not least, we will give a little outlook to webinar number three, because um, as you might know, this is a, um, series of four, four webinars all related to the after sales planning um, and uh, in that uh, agenda point number four we will have time as well to answer your questions. Uh, how my, May said you can post these questions in the chat. Okay and now I hand over for the summary of the webinar number one to Sarah again. Thank you Frank. So let's recap what we address in the first webinar and if we go to the next slide then we see that in the first webinar we address the business case behind ESPP. So why are we doing this series with focus on the after sales and the CP extended service parts planning and what is the relevance of it from a business perspective? We saw the main aspects that had answered this question and Frank actually point to three of these aspects. One, the service business really provides a very attractive profit potential. The after sales has roughly 50 to 60% profit margin and that of course adds revenue to your product sales. Second and another important point is customer satisfaction. Customers shall be satisfied not just with the product, but also with the service business that comes after the sales. And a happy customer is also a customer that develops brand loyalty. And third, and the last point is related with the trade-off of the after sales. So the trade-off between increasing service levels and at the same time managing your inventory levels. And the idea of investing in your after sales market is exactly the potential that you have to increase your service levels while reducing your inventory levels. And this is what brings us to ESPP, SAP Extended Service Parts Planning. So these were also the reasons why from SAP side we said there is a potential on this market to invest and we decided to bring service parts planning originally part of the SEM suite in APO to S4HANA, creating the extended service parts planning. So we took all the knowledge that we had already with SPP in APO and we put into this new solution, this new platform, allowing us well to do some enhancements and have a more simplified UI and processes while doing this. We also benefit now from the S4HANA business technology platform, so which will allow the product to benefit from the path of innovation. And the solution is available, as the title says, thank you, Frank, since 2020. And now with the release 21 and now the further release 22, we will also offer a decentral version that will allow you to connect ESPP with one or multiple S4HANA ERPs. So if you want to know more about the architecture, do take a look at the webinar one, where both Frank and my colleague Beatrice Holder provided an overview. So I will address now very succinctly, because it's not the scope of this webinar, but what is SAP S4HANA supply chain for extended service parts planning, just to ensure we are all on the same page. So service parts management and ESPP is an aftermarket comprehensive solution for planning and manage the extended service parts network 
with a global view into the existing planning situation for our parts warehouse. This means we are not looking at a single location. It links and overlooks the complete distribution network. So from distribution centers down to the customers. And it focuses on reduction of the inventory throughout the network, leveraging exactly the network for the calculation of safety stocks, target risk levels, and trigger processes, the procurement and the fulfillment processes. Here in the middle row, you see exactly the main functionalities and process steps within extended service part planning. Extended service part planning consists in a series of planning runs that shall be executed automatically. And ESPP is built for high volume parts, high automation and low touch. What does it mean? The system is actually an alert based concept that is triggered when the planner intervention is needed and mostly in exceptional cases. You see on the left hand side some of the functional highlights and also some of the benefits. We detailed them in the first webinar. And now if we go to the next slide, we see as well what were the main core functions that we saw and demo in webinar one. So we addressed capture demand and we saw that now we can reach to sales order directly in S4HANA to create demand history. We address stocking and destocking service that indicates which locations inventory shall be stocked or destocked. We address forecasting and we saw that it's performed to determine the best forecast model for a location product combination and how several forecasting methods available can be adjusted to specific parts. We saw then that inventory planning executed, allowing to plan the optimal stock for location products and calculating therefore the economic order quantity and the safety stock for each product location combination within the network. Finally, Frank also gave an overview on the multi echelon optimization with IDP. And if we go to the next slide, we see again our uh, line from different planning runs in ESPP. And if you see the first three boxes are in different color, this was exactly the processes we addressed in webinar one. And today, Frank will address the three remaining box with ERP, so distribution requirement planning, trigger the step to procurement, showing then how the parts are distributed within deploying, and finally also show how you can do inventory balancing processes within your network. So back to you. Yeah, th thanks a lot, um, Sarah, for this um, update. Uh, I, of course, hope that everybody um, was taking part on the webinar one, but if not, you just have at least a little of an overview what we covered and you always can um, redo the webinar on your own. It's accessible uh, to the public um, if you want to no more details. Coming to the operational part of the ESPP covering DRP deployment and inventory balancing today. Um, so we, we do start with the um, DRP process flow and, and DRP in general. So DRP is the distribution requirements planning. That is what DRP stands for. And with other words, it's a it's the answer to the question, what do we need to um, procure from our suppliers? That is the main goal of this uh, planning process. Um, it is calculating the um, net demand for each location within the bill of distribution, starting from the lowest location up to the uh, top level, so that at the end of the day or at the end of the run, we exactly know what to procure from the supplier, the quantity and the exact dates. So uh, the goal of this process is to create the procurement a proposal at the end of this process. Um, we have several inputs. We have the forecast, we have uh, receipts, we have inventory, so that meaning the actual stock situation, how much stock we do have on hand, and the uh, confirmed uh, requirements um, as well are taken into account. And from the left-hand side, uh, all the information uh, that came out of the inventory planning uh, needs to be taken into account as well. The economic order quantity, uh, the economic order quantity period, if that is um, customized like this. Of course, the safety stock is very important for the uh, net demand calculation and for the DRP run. 
and the replenishment indicator and deployment indicator. So usually uh, DRP runs only for stopped materials um, because we only need to take care and procure the ones we want to uh, put in our warehouses. Um, however, it can be executed for non-stocked if you do not have a back order processing, a good one in place. Um, and the deployment indicator is important as well uh, because uh, uh, from the scheduling perspective, it, it's different if you are going with a pull or push deployment. We will see that differentiation later on. Um, um, DRP can handle uh, scheduling agreements or single orders. So in case that we are working with scheduling agreements, DRP would create a schedule line or multiple schedule lines within scheduling agreements. And on the purchase order or single order um, process, it is creating a purchase requisition or a purchase order. And we have a uh, sophisticated DRP approval process in place on multiple levels. So you can uh, customize different management approvals if you go uh, above a certain threshold or below. So um, that is optional. You can uh, implement that or you can go directly from the DRP run to the procurement proposal. How, how this is, is working in detail, just some um, further details to the net demand calculation, um, because if you're not familiar with the after sales planning tool, it's probably helpful to have a closer look on this one. Um, sometimes um, uh, you think that is my forecast and I order what I did forecast, but that is uh, actually not the case. Um, this, this is an example for the net demand calculation on a customer facing location. On Tuesday, we have our projected stock. On Wednesday, we getting some confirmed receipts from our parent location. We have requirements from the customer side and these both together uh, lead to the fact that we drop below the safety stock on Wednesday. Um, we have a net demand up to our safety stock and then we apply rounding rules and having a an rounded net demand either on EOQ like in our examples we will see in the system or PEC specs whatever rounding rules you apply and this uh, rounded net demand is then addressed to the um, parent location and we expect if we address it uh, in time that we get it the same way when we need uh, same day when we need it so on wednesday and on the entry location it looks almost the same but you do see that the uh, the days are different here so on the entry location we collect all the we have a projected stock and then we collect all the demand from the child locations which is then lowering our uh, our stock, of course. We drop as well below the reorder point on Monday this time. Um, we um, have a net demand, we round it up using rounding rules and have a projected stock and that need to be addressed to the supplier then, this rounded net demand. In this case, we have a lead time of zero, so we would end up on Monday with this projected stock and that is ensuring that the child on Wednesday, uh, we are able to uh, deliver, distribute the required demand. So that is how it works. And it starts on the lowest level of the BOD and is aggregating um, each level until the entry location. The central tool for the DRP is a DRP matrix. It's the heart of the DRP, so to say. <laughs> this, this DRP matrix is controlling, steering, um, everything within the DRP. And oh my chin went down, okay. And um, makes all the values visible to the planner. So that is a main tool for the planner as well. It gives the planner a, a large, a, bit, a great overview um, about all the actual demands and receipt situation in the DRP um, on every uh, location of the BOD actually. Um, dear, oh, I said that already, so that's, that, that's fine, but um, slides uh, are not the best to show everything. So therefore, 
Um, let's jump into the system. Um, I will present a little DRP demo where we explain the DRP matrix in detail with all the key figures, horizons. Uh, we will uh, create net demand on a lower location and then at the end of the day we we will see how the DRP matrix is reacting on, on this um, uh, change actually. So I noticed that uh, I got locked off, so I need to log on to the system again. Give me one second. All right. Here we go. Continue and ending. Yes. All right. So that is the, the system. Uh, if you joined webinar one, you have seen that that before. And starting with the um, demo on the DRP, we will start, of course, with the heart of the DRP, the DRP matrix. Um, we are choosing our example product and we push simply the go button on the upper level like in all the other uis we have seen we are seeing the bill of distribution how our uh, network looks like um and in this example we are starting uh with uh the customer facing location uh, that is spp7 in that sense a double click leads us to the uh drp matrix what we see here is we have different horizons. So that is in blue here, the procurement lead time uh, to SPP1. So from Dortmund to Düsseldorf um, is has a different color. And then we have the normal planning horizon. And in red, we have the overdues. Uh, so if we have some overdue uh, demands uh, in the system. We have key figures on the left-hand side. We have uh, the cross, the total cross demand, um, which you can expand here. And in our example, we have only uh, demand from forecasts. So these 90, uh, 87 pieces are the daily forecast for that part in that location. Um, but we do, might have in other cases, different uh, demand aspects. Uh, if there is something on the way to that location, we would see it in a total cross uh, receipts that are already confirmed. We see the initial warehouse stock on that location and we are having the projected stock, uh, which are kind of clear key figures. Um, if we are running into a shortage, we will see the supply shortage here as well on each location. So in that case, on the 2nd of February, we see the safety stock uh, for each location. Uh, down here, we have the economic order quantity and economic uh, AOQ period in order um, for the rounding to understand uh, what we, uh, how our net demand is rounded. And then we have the unrounded and rounded net demand as a key fig figure as well. I didn't want to expand that. So and, and and we have a nice little uh, button here that is a simulation of the DRP and um, um, yeah I'm doing that now and you see we uh, the, we 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 now see some changes and um, to explain the the numbers and the figures is here on the first of February we have projected stock of 94 and I uh, uh, 49 and we have a demand on the next day of 87 and that is leading us to a shortage of 38 pieces this is increasing the next day because we still have a demand on the next day um so this is the shortage is increasing to 226 um and on the 4th of february we have additional demand coming in and we have the safety stock as well that we need to cover so on that day we have a shortage um, of uh, 223 which is our net demand assuming that our um, parent location can deliver in time and has something on stock that will arrive uh, at the last in, in the last day of the lead time and then we will um, have 
uh, the goods receipt and all of a sudden we have a projected stock because we do round this unrounded net demand with the full EOQ. So we would uh, order or we would uh, yeah, procure or order on the on, from our parent location this number uh, 1,822 so that we end up with a projected stock uh, of 1,600. And that is continued over the full planning cycle. So if we scroll to the right, we have the same situation uh, in beginning of uh, March. So on the 2nd of March, we drop below our um, safety stock while we having projected stock of 30, um, demand of 87 and an unrounded net demand of, 78, of uh, 67. And we round that to the full EOQ. So, and that is visible on every single uh, location in the network. So, if we go to SPP1, we are going to exactly know where the demand on SPP1 on our parent is coming from. And uh, if we open that gross demand here and look into the end of February here, the second, uh, 22nd of February, that is where the demand beginning of March from our location seven is now popping up, right? We see exactly the same number and with 10 days uh, ahead. So that is because of the procurement lead time. Um, and that gives you a large and big visibility of how your network is really working. What is the demand within the full network? And even going uh, to the next level on SPP0, our entry location, we see exactly what's going on in the whole network. Where is the demand coming from and what do we need to procure? Here we have a little bit of different, different horizons. We have a freeze horizon on the entry location. That is when the material is already on the truck. So we really cannot change the demand in that horizon. We have a limited freeze horizon, which usually is the, 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 the material is not on the truck yet, but it's somewhere in the yard. So we can have a, still have a chance to um, discuss with the supplier to change uh, what he is shipping to us in, in that horizon. And then we have the plan submission horizon. And you see as well that um, we have the rounded net demand, the same key figure as we saw on the uh, lower locations. Uh, here we have uh, three additional key figures uh, with regard to the supplier because we are on the entry location. And this rounded net demand here needs to be shipped three days ahead from the, of, uh, from the supplier to the entry location. And this demand here on the uh, 7th of February need to be shipped on the 2nd of February from the supplier. This one needs to be shipped here and so on and so on. So. Um, that is really a very, very transparent um, matrix. And you, you do see, I, I open once again, this cross demand, you see exactly which location has what um, demand and to which location do I have to deliver what. So we have the full network here. And for each location, we see exactly the date when we need to deliver to that location in order to, to not run into a shortage in our whole network. So, um, and um, now I'm, of course, we, we just simulated it. So we are not creating any purchase requisition in this example. And if I go to the um, schedule maintenance board, we see as well that we do not have anything uh, created with regard to the supplier. So if I push the go button, there is no orders um, created yet because I simulated only, but if I execute the DRP run, which I'm doing right now um, interactively finished, it can be of course, or it will be usually done in the background. And if I go now to the um, schedule board, we will see that we have created exactly the purchase requisitions um, that 
we uh, expected. So you see the quantities here are exactly the same um, and you see the periods when and which period it is created. And if I open a second uh, view that is probably more known to you because or if you if you know the the old ERP or S4 already, oh no, that was the wrong one. That I didn't want to do. I wanted to open the MD04 in parallel and in the MD04 we immediately see all the requirements for that uh, location as well. So because we are an integrated system, we are on one box and here you do see all the purchase requisition that I just uh, created right now with the same amounts. And now, of course, you can um, go forward and transform this uh, purchase requisition into an order, or you can do it uh, when they are transferred from ESPP into the S4 um, completely automated in the background. All right, that is um, how DRP works. And um, that is the, the main message is you have a really a centralized view um, of all demands within your network and you can really have a great control what to send to the supplier and when. Going back to the uh, presentation, actually, the next process um, is, of course, we ordered the material in the DRPs or using DRP side. And if the demand or if, if the, the products are uh, arriving on the entry location, we need to split that and distribute that demand into our network. And that is actually what the deployment run is taken care of. Um, if we see uh, the, the, the process flow, it is, looks almost the same. And actually, it, indeed, it is almost the same because every deployment run is executing a DRP run in the background again in order to react on the actual, most actual situation. When, when the deployment run or between the, the deployment run and the order creation, we have a time delay. So the demand situation could be different compared to the deployment run uh, that, that was uh, ordering or that was in charge to create the orders. Um, and therefore, every deployment uh, is executing uh, a DRP in the background in order to see really the actual demand. Um, so we have the same inputs, uh, forecast, uh, stock, uh, safety stock, rounding profiles, indicators. So um, that is um, done in the background and we we execute that and we we creating stock transfer proposals uh, in that sense based on the real actual demand that is required on each location of course we have the same we can have an approval uh, process in place on top which i have in our examples as well um, there are two more aspects in the deployment. So we have different deployment modes. So we have the pull deployment and push deployment, which, re which are reacting differently. Pull deployment is triggered by a need from the child location um, and is covered um, from, the, from the inventory that is available on the parent location. And the push deployment is reacting differently. It is triggered by a goods receipt from the parent location. So only when new goods arriving, we are push them down to the child locations. Of course, only to uh, the child's needs, but we are not going the way that we put it into the warehouse, put it in to increase our uh, stock. And then when the uh, demand from the child arrives, we pull it out of the warehouse and bring it down to the child. So this push deployment reacts um, differently and it is uh, the, the parent, lo parent location stock remains untouched. So, and, and that um, uh, picture on the right-hand side is just um, picture or depicting or, or explaining that again. So if we have a need uh, within the lead time on the child location, depending on the deployment mode, it is taken from the stock on hand on the uh, pull deployment uh, uh, scenario and only the goods receipt uh, 
quantity is taken into account for deployment if we have a push deployment. And of course, on the left-hand side, child one, nothing would be uh, pulled or pushed because there is no demand in the replenishment lead time. There's one aspect I did not mention, but I think it is written here. Yes, the stock transfer proposals are created always due or they, they are always due to today. So we are not looking into a future, into the future and not creating stock transfers that are due next week. And the, the reason is clear because next week the demand situation and stock situation and inventory situation might, ha might have changed and we need to correct this uh, stock transfer. Therefore, we just run it every day and create it every single day. There are a couple more deployment modes, so um, that's probably um, not interesting, uh, not very interesting as an overview, but you can uh, overcome or, or skip certain levels in the BOD so the supplier can deliver directly to a distribution center or even to a customer location if you want to. And the second important part is in the deployment mode. Uh, if everything is uh, very smooth and the distributable quantity is higher than the demand, no problem at all. Every location gets what they want. The problem starts when it is the, different, the way around. The distributable quantity is smaller than the demand over the lead time of all my child locations. Then I need to think about what I'm doing with the, within that situation. And therefore, deployment in ESPP has a very tough, from my point of view at least, um, fair share logic in place. Um, so we have different priority tiers where we split demand according to the priority. We have a fair share logic that is uh, strongly customizable and we have sequence rules for the rounding um, as the last step. The best way is that I'm explaining the example, I think that makes it crystal clear, hopefully. So in that example, we have a parent uh, with 150 pieces on stock and two childs with the different demands. In priority tier one, highest priority, we have the back orders and that can be covered for both childs. So all of the, all sum up that together is 90 pieces. Tier two is a, is a counted as a fixed demand and we have 45 and uh, 90 plus 45, um, then we have remaining 15 pieces out of our 150 um, for the next year. And the next year is a forecast and the forecast is 45 now. And that cannot be covered fully by the remaining 15 pieces. So what the system or how our example works now, this 15 pieces on the right hand side is split fair share according to the demand quantity. So the child one has a higher demand than child two. So child one is getting uh, 8.3 and child two getting 6.6 .6 out of this 15 as a fair share rule. So that, that means after applying fair share out of this 150, child one would get 83.3 and 66.6 uh, is the remaining quantity for child number two. And now we can apply rounding rules as well. So um, of course we cannot split uh, every piece. So we have rounding rules in place in this case in uh, pieces of hex size of five. And uh, the sequence rule is depending on the lead time. So we first round the child with the longest lead time. In this case, that is child one. So this 83 got rounded up to 85. And the lead time for child two is just two days. And in this case, we have only 65 remaining because we rounded already uh, to 58. So the second child would get uh, 50 or 65 in this example. That is of course all customizable, but uh, the, the main message here is in a case of a shortage, you can really define very detailed rules um, in order to, to execute a fair share handling. So no pokering anymore, no first come first serve anymore, no lucky locations anymore. So you can really have a transparent rules 
showing how you deal with shortages. All right, uh, let's jump to the system and have a little deployment demo. So one on the pull deployment side, um, I will execute that. I will uh, shortly demonstrate how fair share works. And then we have a push deployment scenario in place as well um, as the example, uh, as a demo in our system. So let's get back to the uh, S4 system. And let's close this one here. And we all um, start over with the DRP matrix again. This time we are taking a different product that I prepared. So we are having this product now. Situation, uh, this time we are looking in a different part of the bill of distribution. We go on our location SPP4 and see that the DRP matrix um, looks like this, if I can scroll. Um, yes, so we have enough uh, initial values, stock, we have projected stock, procurement lead time, so no shortage, no, um, so it, it really looks, looks good. There is no um, requirement, even if I simulate uh, in a short horizon. So on the 14th of February, there is a demand. So, and on the um, parent location, which is uh, SPP3, um, is that correct? Yes, that is correct. We should have already a shortage, actually, and that is the case. Oh, that isn't the case. That is... Give me a second. We should have a shortage here. There is something something wrong. Um, that is a live demo, as you see now. Um, I ah. SPP four, SPP three. We had enough. No, we don't have a shortage here. We would have enough stock to create that, but we should have a shortage. However, um, yeah, I, I continue. No, we, we do have enough shortage, we have enough, but there is no demand. So I'm, I'm running, um, open, open a second, second, second screen. Um, that is the, uh, pull deployment scenario and not the uh, the push deployment scenario. So in the deployment and inventory um, situation, there is for that part no, um, no stock transfer scheduled yet. So, and if I run my planning run, if I run deployment in the background, which I am what I'm what I'm doing right now. Um, we see that there is nothing created because it was not necessarily the demand was on the 14th. So we are not creating anything right now. So we are going back to the approval screen uh, and no STO stock transfer. That there are stock transfer created as we see here, but nothing from SPP3 to SPP4. So there's really nothing created because according to deployment, we need something on the 14th. So nothing to do at the moment in this situation. All right. And now I'm, I'm changing the demand on SPP4. Uh, I'm creating additional demand on the lower location. I'm doing that with a function that is called um, fixed demand. So we just simply adding to the forecast um, some new demand, and that is um, on the 
end of the replenishment lead time. So replenishment lead time was three days. So I'm creating uh, this additional demand, which will be visible um, as soon in the DRP matrix. So if we open the matrix again for the same part, we will exactly see the difference. So, and the difference is visible here, right? So now we have demand on the first that is consisting out of forecast and out of my fixed demand. And now I'm running the pull deployment again. And now I would expect the system, yes, now um, I need to bring something down to that location. So I push a refresh here and now we see exactly that the system is creating this per, uh, stock transfer order from SPP3 to SPP4. So and as a second explanation, I'm running a little bit short, I need to hurry. Um, second explanation is that I would like to show you the fair share. So we go to the deployment and inventory balancing situation or a screen and we are going a different part um, and we going to pull deployment as well is fine so here we are simulate and now I'm, I'm simulating the pull deployment only for that part I'm not executing it uh, in the with the background job and what we see here now is that the system is creating or proposing stock transfers from SPP zero to one, two, three, five, and seven, uh, six. And if we go to the normal shipment requirement, we do see that um, the demand over lead time is higher than the actual quantity. And here you see the different tiers, and we can see that uh, the system started on, on tier six, which is the rounding according to AOQ with a fair share. Tier five can be fulfilled completely, but tier six, we start the fair share rules. And this location, even if it has so much demand over the lead time is getting 425. This one is getting 350 and so on. And that can be really displayed very detailed and all the uh, the the rules can be set up um, as you wish. And no pokering, no um, fighting for this stuff anymore if it's not enough demand available. Um, continuing to the uh, push deployment. So push deployment is, is very interesting as well. And that is... Um, executed of course on a different um, part as well and I would like to show you where you where we maintain this so that is on part number one is the same part but a different location if we go to location seven we see that the deployment indicator for this part on this location is push deployment so on this location the demand is triggered by a goods receipt on the entry location. And if we now go uh, back to the DRP matrix again, close to this one, I guess it is still somewhere open. Yes, it is open here. So we see the situation on, on location number seven. We already have a shortage, right? We already have a shortage of 163 and we round it up. So we have a demand of 658. And on my location one, here, that's why I was confused. Uh, on, on the first example, we already do have a shortage. So we cannot create a, purchase, a stock transfer to seven. And if we simply book a goods receipt in that location, uh, then all of a sudden by doing nothing else, we do have um, an, um, a stock transfer for this one. So I uh, reject those one and delete those ones. Uh, 
um, so that we do not have anything for this uh, product. And now I simply um, book a goods receipt. So I go back, I'm going to the goods movement, and now I simply book for that material nothing else than a goods receipt of let's say 700 pieces and I book that to our SPP1 in that location and I post this booking and that is all all I did so and the system now in the background create or generated a, a push deployment run and now hopefully all of a sudden we should have here a proposal from SPP1 to SPP7 and that is the quantity exactly uh, the shortage during the lead time so our uh, material that is arriving on SPP1 is not putting to stock um, it is directly pushed down to the child location with the required quantity all right uh, that was a pull uh, the the push deployment scenario and that was actually everything i wanted to show you in the system and i think there are still one or two slides um, regarding the inventory balancing as a third process um, of the operational planning and um, inventory balancing is, is a real alternative to the procurement and deployment so uh, instead of procuring the parts we of course can look into our complete network if uh, there there are some locations that have uh, an excess and some other locations might have a need and then it's probably beneficial instead of procuring from a supplier and bringing through the network via deploy deployment uh, to pull it from somewhere else of the within the bod uh, and ship it from a nearby location instead of procuring and deployment uh, run. So for that, we have to define an inventory balancing area. And I simply explain that on that example here. Um, this is the deployment, uh, the inventory balancing area. And if a deployment run is executed in this example, we have an uh, excess stock on A11 and on A111. And we have a need on these two locations on 113 and 121. And if a deployment uh, if inventory balancing run is now executed, this excess here on A111 would lead to a stock transfer proposal to 113 to cover these 40 pieces. Of course, it cannot be covered completely because the need, uh, the excess is not 40. So only 25 are covered from this 40. And these here, these pieces or these 50 pieces, this need can be covered from AA1 because that is not part of deployment, uh, but is part of inventory balancing area. And in this example, inventory balancing would bring these 50 pieces and not A12 or A1 uh, need to do a procurement and send it down here. And if inventory balancing is running before deployment, these two stock transfers would be created. And if deployment run then runs normally after inventory balancing, the remaining 15 pieces that are still short on this A113 would then be uh, deployed via a stock transfer order from A11. So in that sense, A11 is, is already aware that 25 pieces are coming from a nearby location. And of course, that is executed only when it's beneficial. So uh, first, the excess and need determination is executed and a match between a need and an excess location is, is found based on the stock, on the receipts and requirements. And then a cost benefit analysis is uh, executed. So where the transfer cost and a stock holding cost, inventory costs are taken into account. And only if it's beneficial, based on the rules you maintained, you customize in the system, a stock transfer uh, proposal is created. And of course, the same as in DRP and deployment, an approval process is in place as well. 
I don't have anything um, in the system for the inventory balancing so far, but that actually covers now the end-to-end. -end. In the first webinar, we covered um, from the capture demand over forecasting, safety stock calculation, and now we have um, covered how much do we need to order from the supplier, how can we enable the system to split it, distribute it into the network, and how can we um, implement alternative sourcing uh, ways like inventory balancing. Um, I'm quite sure that you have a lot of, uh, not, not quite sure, but I can check if there are uh, questions in the chat and there are some, but first uh, I'd like to give you um, a little outlook on the, on the next uh, webinar um, because that is more important, not, not more important, but important to share with you. The questions, if I cannot answer everything right now, um, due to time or due to knowledge, let's see, um, then I for sure will pick it up and um, answer this question um, later, later on within an email. So next webinar, very important. You think we covered everything, but we don't actually. <laughs> so next webinar is on the 3rd of March, same time, uh, 4 to 5. We do a little wrap up uh, what we did so far, and then we dive deeper into inventory balancing. And we show you why inventory balancing, uh, IBP, not inventory balancing, IBP um, module for inventory optimization. And we explain why it makes sense to ac actually implement both uh, together. We will see what IBP is. We will um, see how the integration works and we will actually execute a multi-echelon optimization run instead of a single echelon optimization run of the safety stock. That will be covered in webinar number three. All right, and now we still have seven minutes uh, left, I think, um, in order to answer your questions. Yes, that is going to be the last slide. Um, I'm shortly scroll to the questions. Yes, the first, first one is, is an easy one. How are the locations connected within the network? Do we use transportation lanes? Exactly. We are having a transportation lane um, that, that are connecting the ESPP um, locations and uh, mainly for the deployment. And if we have an inventory balancing area as uh, pictured in the couple slides uh, before this one here, um, then of course inventory balancing works only if uh, all locations in that inventory balancing area that we need to define are connected via transportation lanes or transportation relationships with transportation lanes. Um, are all the existing key figures uh, in SPP available in ESPP as well? Have we introduced any new key figures for DRP and deployment, which will be helped uh, as part of ESPP? Um, so on the first releases, we have exactly uh, the same key figures. Um, when we execute the um, multi-echelon optimization, um, we have, I think, an additional key figure that shows the compared safety stock that is uh, done by the single echelon and by multi echelon. But in general, we have exactly the same key figures um, that are available uh, in, the, in the system in almost all um, planning processes. It does not mean that it, that, that additional will come um, because it's much easier meanwhile by moving that back into S4 to uh, create key figures and uh, bring additionals in the system. So the next one is, does ESPP has a direct integration with any of supplier collaboration tool like Ariba? Um, how do we send the procurement plans such as schedule lines or purchase orders to the vendors or suppliers? So um, if you know the old SPP, there was a uh, separate tool on the APO box, supplier network collaboration that was totally integrated into SPP and on the APO box, uh, taking over the integration to the suppliers. 
Um, this time we um, are in S4 and S4 is connected uh, usually or can be connected standardwise to Ariba. So, um, so that's that. That's why the answer is um, there is no additional tool that is integrating the uh, suppliers uh, than Ariba. So, um, that would be the uh, choice, a tool of choice that is used. Uh, you still have the the old standard way to to send out the purchase requisition via S4, and it's a little bit different um, if you work with single orders or scheduling agreements. You still have a release process on the ESPP with regard to the scheduling agreements, because then you can send the schedule lines in different horizons. So you usually have your your fixed horizon that is crystal clear, and then you have your your you can share the forecast schedule lines with the supplier as well. But SNC is not in place anymore. Ariba is the tool of choice. Can we configure freeze horizon or plan submission horizon in ESPP by changing which lead time components should be configured? Yes, exactly. That is uh, how ESPP works. So um, you have two choices. You can go with a, a constant lead time or with a component lead time. And depending on the component lead time, you can justify the scheduling and the horizons. Can we use the stability rules in ESPP or expedite and de-expedite orders as a part of DRP? Yes, exactly. The functionality is still in place um, and you can implement the stability rules in the DRP and expedite and de-expedite in both horizons. Of course, not in the freeze horizons, but in the limited freeze and in the planning submission horizon, you can use these um, um, stability rules, and as far as I know, um, there is no um, enhancement in place uh, compared to the old SPP. Do you also see the inventory on hand or projected inventory per location in the DRP matrix? I think, yes, we, we did see that. That was the projected um, stock. Stock on hand is a projected stock. Um, and you see that on the timeline every day. Shifting safety stock. So, and it is important to know if a location generated demand to a shifting safety stock or another location has a real customer demand. So um, that that is that is that is not a deep. DRP question that is more a deployment question. So uh, if you have sufficient stock, then it is the, the DRP does not really need to be care of that. But if, if you don't run into a shortage, the deployment will see what is customer demand, what is a back order, and what is simply safety stock filling up or forecasting, and is reacting and not shifting everything down to every location. Um, so it is exactly defined uh, on your, you can exactly define it on your way, what you, how you would like to react in these cases. Do you also see inventory on hand projected inventory on a location? Yes, that was posted. Coming closer. Can we use the existing EWM solution to trigger push and push deployment in ESPP or do we need extended EVM to connect with ESPP? That's one I cannot answer. I need to take it with me. And there are a couple more, which are two more only, which I will answer via email because it's 5 p.m. Um, big thanks from my side to everybody that was listening to the webinar, I hope. Um, that was what you expected. Um, hope I covered um, everything that you expected and um, hope to see you on webinar number three, where we deep dive into IBP and the integration between ESPP and IBP. Sarah, last words goes to you. Yeah, thank you also from my side, everyone, for attending. And thank you, Frank and Pesanava once more for having us from the city side on board. All right. Nice evening, everyone. Thanks a lot. Cheers.